Today I'm continuing my series on weak interactions with electron and positron emission. Now electron and positron emission are a form of beta decay, which is called beta decay because the electron is called a beta particle. And the positron is a beta particle as well, uh, since it's the opposite of an electron. Now both of these are really important in medical imaging, is where you've probably heard of it because they'll have you ingest a radioactive substance that may be tagged so that it collects in a certain area or may just collect there naturally. And you can track all sorts of things. You can track the fluid flow from the heart, look for heart problems. You can have it tagged to look for cancer, look for cancer problems. And in particular with positron emission tomography, PET scans, you may have heard of, that uses the positron emission. So these are really important. And in the early days of physics from over 100 years ago, they didn't really understand how this happened. And the, one of the big problems is that the energy didn't add up when a neutron decayed or a neutron was produced and so they had to invent a neutrino to get the energy balance to work out and ever since then it's been assumed that a neutrino was involved and then when the quark theory was invented they had to come up with a way to get electrons or positrons out of quarks and so they had to invent the W and Z boson and what they missed is that you can explain this with quantum fluctuation interactions instead and eliminate the W and Z bosons and, and eliminate neutrinos from the theory entirely and come up with a much simpler theory. So what happens when a positron is emitted, you end up converting a proton to a neutron. And the way that happens is we have a proton, and as I've discussed in previous videos, a proton has a shell of quantum fluctuations around it that causes scattering. So we know that from scattering uh, experiments. And the scattering, we know they're called partons because it's a name that Feynman came up with, but we know now that they're quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations must be polarized with respect to the central charge in the proton, the actual, what you could call a bare proton. And the charge is evenly distributed. It doesn't have three point charges in it. It just has a central polarizer and then surrounded by the shell uh, based on the experiments we've done on the charge distribution within the neutron. So we have this central polarizer surrounded by a shell of quantum fluctuations. And in order for an electron to combine with a proton and produce a neutron, it has to have some way of getting through the shell. And the electron has its own shell at the Compton radius, and this shell is responsible for the magnetic moment and the mass of the electron. And this shell is responsible for magnetic moment and mass of the proton. So somehow we have to get a bare electron without all this added shell of pollen fluctuations that are polarized around it inside the proton in order to convert it to a neutron, as we see. So we have this proton surrounded by a shell and it interacts with the quantum fluctuation, an electron-positron quantum fluctuation, where the electron has, is inside the shell when the quantum fluctuation comes into existence and the positron is outside the shell. And then the electron gets captured, converting this to a neutron, and the neutron has a shell around it and because it has a charge distribution it's not perfectly zero it has a charge distribution as 
even though it's lower energy than the quantum fluctuation. It actually goes positive and then negative. Um, put that up. Put an image up on that. And then the positron becomes free. Now, in a normal free proton case, the positron would have to annihilate immediately with an electron. So, because there isn't enough energy for the positron to become free. But when we're looking at nuclear decay, the nucleus as a whole has excess energy. The positron emission process reduces the energy, making the nucleus more stable. And that excess energy goes into making the positron stable, because that requires 511 MeV. And it also gives the positron its, its energy, its kinetic energy. And then, as I said, with positron emission, we want to have enough kinetic energy that it can reach the scanner and be detected. So this is how positron emission happens. And then within the nucleus, you increase, um, you decrease the atomic number, you subtract one proton, so the Z number decreases, but the atomic weight changes very little and only gains the mass of the electron and a little bit extra. Then when we look at electron emission, it pretty much happens the same way. You have, in this case, a neutron. So you have a proton electron inside, bare proton, bare electron. Or, if you believe in the quark model, you have the quarks that approximate having a bare proton, bare electron. But in either case, it can interact with a positron in order to convert to a neutron. I mean, to convert to a proton. So, we have a quantum fluctuation where the positron is inside the neutron's wall of quantum fluctuations. And then an electron outside. And then the electron becomes free when it escapes. And the positron and the electron that are inside the proton shell annihilate, leaving just a proton. So that is once again how this happens. And because this neutron is inside the nucleus, the nucleus has excess energy. It's becoming more stable when this happens. And the excess energy goes into producing the electron and giving it its kinetic energy. And so that's how the emission happens. And there's no neutrino required to trigger this or, or take care of excess energy, and no W or Z is, is needed if we're just dealing with bare electrons and protons instead of quarks. Now we also have another situation where instead of electron-positron, we can have this neutron decay happening due to a proton and antiproton quantum fluctuation. In the proton-mediated beta decay, we have a neutron that has a bare proton and bare electron inside of it, or something approximating that in the quark theory. And then you have a proton-antiproton quantum fluctuation. And if the proton quantum fluctuation is inside, it can annihilate with the pro proton, I mean, if the antiproton quantum fluctuations inside, it'll annihilate with the proton, leaving just an electron. And then the proton from the quantum fluctuation becomes free outside. We have a very simple process where the electron emission decay can be mediated by a proton antiproton pair instead of an electron positron pair. And that can produce two separate types of electron emissions with two separate types of energy. And we see that uh, in, some, in some cases. There are some atoms that have two separate energy levels due to two different types of interactions. And there may even be a third type of interaction, but I won't go into that. So this is basically how electron and positron emission happens. 
It's a simple quantum fluctuation interaction. It doesn't involve WZ particles. It doesn't involve neutrinos. And it's just a simple extension of quantum field theory. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something about weak interactions involving electrons, positrons, and how that relates to radioactive decay. And if you do, please like, share it with your physicist friends, subscribe to see more of my videos. And I also have books for sale on quantum field theory and particle theory. And if you want to learn more about these series, you can find it in my books. In particular, the Zero Point Universe describes this in greater detail. But my book, Goodbye Quarks, The Ionian Theory, describes the particle structure in much more detail, which is also interesting. And I'm a retired independent researcher, so if you purchase one of my books, that helps me in my retirement, and I appreciate that. I also have a Patreon account if you'd like to support my research and my video production that way. So thanks for watching.